Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to welcome you to our first Young Wavemaker seminar of the year. My name is Ava. I'm the uh, Assistant K Perpetua Coordinator. Um, and welcome to our first Young Wavemaker seminar. <laughs> So today we're going to be hearing from Brenna, um, but first I'd like to just take the opportunity to introduce you all to K Perpetua and tell everybody about our collaborative. So um, we work in the K Perpetua area, so generally speaking from Yahats to Florence. Um, the K Perpetua area encompasses Oregon's largest marine reserve. So it's a fully protected marine protection area and two neighboring MPAs as well as the seabird protection area. So we also work in the National Forest next to us, as our program is pretty designed to showcase the interconnectedness of um, our land and the sea. And in 2017, uh, we all came together to form the K Perpetua Collaborative. So our vision is to um, foster connection and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from land to the sea in and around the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve. So that's what today is for. And we do a lot more than this. Um, so we've got some amazing citizen science participation experiences that you guys could definitely be a part of if you would like. Um, so we host opportunities like our sea star monitoring, um, marine debris surveys, and bio blitzes, such as our fungi bio blitz. If anybody was at the mushroom festival recently in Yahats, that would be pretty on brand. Um, and things like our seabird colony monitoring and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, we've also got in the field learning opportunities like our tide bowl tours in the summer with um, our guide Jamie, who is right over here if you can see my mouse. Love Jamie. Hi. Um, and coming up our uh, land sea symposium which will be our 11th year doing that and that's in november um but we couldn't do any of this without our, all of our amazing volunteers so people like our marine reserve ambassadors who table out the smelt stand safe park um who are there every weekend in the summer and we hope to bring in more opportunities in the future so if you would like to be involved in any of our events or um involved in our organization please definitely reach out and we would love to have you in any capacity. Shameless plug, there are many ways that you can support us. One of it would be matching with me in really cool shirts, repping the brand. Um, we also accept donations on the website, but like if you're gonna donate, you might as well get a really cool shirt out of it. So not, not saying you have to, but it's definitely a good idea. <laughs> Um, and here are all of our socials. So on the screen, this is Katie and Jamie, my two other coworkers. Um, and we post really fun stuff online like all the time. So I definitely think you should follow us on Instagram. If you're not already, shame on you, but you can still have the opportunity to fix that. And then we've got our upcoming Young Wave Makers here. Um, so we've got some fun stuff in policy related things with Rachel Hilt on the 6th of November. Um, an actual in-person speaker series with an artist called Janet Esley um, on the 11th of November. And then in December, we've got some Young Wavemaker stuff again with our science communication with So Fox. But today we are here to talk with Brenna. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now and let her take it away. I just wanna thank you all for being here today. Um, this has been a really exciting opportunity for me. Um, and I know a lot of you are my friends and family, but even some of you that haven't met me, um, I really appreciate you coming out and um, listening to what I have to say. Um, so I'm Brenna Rothman. Uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about the rocky shores of the Oregon coast and highlighting OSU's Mangi Lab. Um, I realize this title is a little vague, but it's intentional because there's a lot of things we're going to be talking about, but they all kind of fall under the same category. So let's get started. Um, so I just want to give a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about in this webinar today. Uh, I'm going to give a brief intro about me um, and intertidal overview um, because much of what we do in the Mankey Lab is related to the intertidal zone. Um, so I think it's, it's good to get an idea and get associated with the intertidal before we start talking about um, some of the projects we do. Um, and we're going to talk about what's the Mangi Lab all about. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on student research, and then I would love it if you guys asked me any questions that you had throughout um, the webinar. So, uh, so again, I'm Brenna Rothman. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm a research assistant slash technician uh, in the Mangi Lab, uh, which basically means I am responsible for most of what goes on related to the field work uh, in the Mangi Lab. 
Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Biology with an option in Marine Biology and a minor in Chemistry uh, from Oregon State University. Um, and I first started working in the Menke Lab as a volunteer during February 2021, so um, pretty deep into the pandemic. Um, and I was really excited to get my first uh, real research opportunity. Um, what first started as me sorting biomass, like barnacles from mussels in the in the lab to, to going out into the field and into the rocky intertidal. And I've kind of simply been obsessed since. Um, I'm from Oak Harbor, Washington, which is located on the inner coast of Washington, kind of by the San Juan Islands, if you're familiar with that area. Um, and my unofficial title is, um, I like to say tide pool troll because um, I feel like tide pooling has just become my whole personality and I'm constantly just slinking around algae, um, but I love it. And that's why I'm really excited to give um, this talk today. Um, so let's just talk about the inner tidal zone real fast. Um, in short, it's where the sea meets the land. Granted, there's a lot of different ways that this, this can present in an ecosystem. Um, like mudflats are another good example of like an inner tidal zone. Um, but what we at the Mengi Lab particularly study are rocky shores. And so instead of sand or mud, um, it's rocks. And rocks have a lot of surface area. So there's all sorts of critters that live in and along and, and all the crevices um, of these rocks. So they make for um, a really good substrate and they turn into really a, a super awesome biodiverse community. Um, important thing to know about um, the tides on the Oregon toast, not toast, um, coast, um, is that we have two high tides and two low tides per day. Um, so normally your lower tides are going to be like one, two feet, uh, zero feet, but the best ones are negative tides. Um, and those are best for us to work and also the best for tide pooling, if you're wondering. Um, because when you have such a such a low tide, it's, it's really easy for us to be able to access um, such a, a vast array of life and, um, you know, these intertidal shelves that we can work on when it's really low. Um, and a cool thing about the intertidal zone um, is that most of these organisms have evolved to cope with with being out of the water for extended periods of time. Um, you know, you have these high tides and these low tides, and when they're they're out of water and exposed at low tides, they don't just die. Um, they have evolved over years and years to be able um, to withstand these kind of changes on a on a daily basis. Um, but different portions of the inner tidal experience different um, like wave exposures and and um, the, where the water changes. Um, so there are distinct bands um, and that's called zonation. So I'm gonna get into that. Oh, wow, I love it when it doesn't wanna go. There we go. Um, so let's talk about intertidal zonation. Um, so this is really driven by um, different environments and also abiotic gradients. Um, so wave exposure is a big thing. So the lowest zone of the intertidal and what is closest to the ocean um, gets a lot of water. And so most of the organisms that live there um, don't need to be super hardy because they're out of water for the least amount of time. But the things that live highest up on the rocks or closer to the shore um, experience a lot of desiccation and have to be out of water for a long time. Um, so they've evolved to um, be resilient to this kind of change. Um, so there are three distinct zones of the inner tidal. There's the high, the mid, and the low. And we're going to talk about each. Uh, but this is a good, I think, picture. Um, I hope everyone can see my my cursor. Um, I think this is a really good example of like how you would see intertidal zonation if you're out tide pooling. Um, so here's my kind of cursor here at the bottom. Um, you see there's like all sorts of algae kind of in this, this lower zone, right? But then as you move vertically and kind of up this rock face, it turns kind of into nothing and then just muscle beds, right? So this is a really clear transition between the low zone and the mid zone. Um, so the low zone is the most diverse zone and also the most slippery. I know that all too well. Um, so it's just algae and invertebrates galore. So I want to talk about some of the really cool things that you can find in the low zone um, along the Oregon coast. Um, so this bottom video right here, this is a, a red sea urchin. It's the second most common sea urchin that we have here on the Oregon coast. Um, what you'll typically see if you're out tide pooling is a purple sea urchin. Um, those guys are super abundant all along the west coast. Um, but they're much smaller than these red urchins. Um, one of the grad students in our lab took this really cool video of this red urchin. I was like, I have to use this because this is awesome. So you can see its little spines just moving around and it's a, I, I don't know how happy urchins are, but this one seems like it would be happy. Um, 
And then in this left corner here, you see these kind of yellow blobs. Um, these are sea slugs, also called nudibranchs. Um, and sometimes they look kind of like bunnies. Um, I wish I had included a photo, but um, when these guys are underwater, um, they have these kind of like, they look like ears, but they're actually the rhinophores, um, which are like these sensory organs. And then what kind of looks like a tail right here is actually their gills, which is really neat. Um, if you're wondering what this stuff there on top of is, um, that's actually sponge. And so these sea slugs are actually predatory, even if they're really cute. Um, this next photo here is actually a giant Pacific octopus. Um, this is a really rare low zone find. Um, I've only seen one a couple of times, but it's always like the, I think the coolest thing that you can find in the inner title. So I try to show off my octopus photos whenever I can. Uh, and these guys are sea stars. I will talk more about them shortly because they're actually really cool and really important sea stars for, for this ecosystem. Um, and this kind of far right photo here, um, it might be a little hard to see what is going on. But if you look a little closely, um, it's actually a, a red rock crab that's like burrowed itself into the sand and it's just simply chilling in there. Um, and it's kind of hard to see because this algae is like the same color. Um, but I was out doing a survey one time and I, you know, lift up some algae and like, oh my gosh, there's a rock, there's a rock crab here. Um, so all sorts of things that you can find in the nooks and crannies of the low zone. Um, some other things you can find are tons of anemones. This one is my favorite one, though they aren't super common. This is a painted anemone, or some people call them a Christmas tree anemone. Um, and if you're wondering how I get these super cool underwater photos and videos, um, I do I do put my phone upside down in the water a little bit, just the just the camera. Um, so I can get really cool videos like this, where this um, in this middle panel where this video was playing. Um, this is also a type of sea slug. This is an opalescent nudibranch. Um, I love these ones because their vibrant color is just so interesting. And then this guy here is a purple sea urchin. If you're wondering what these kind of like tube-like projections are coming from this animal, um, it's their tube feet, which this actually allows them to move around in the inner tidal, um, which is really cool because Urchins are really closely related and in the same phylum to sea stars. So this little sea star down here is a Pacific blood star, um, and they also have two feet. So they are able to move around kind of the same way that urchins do. Um, another thing that there is a lot of in the low zone is, oh, no audio, um, is lots of algae. Um, my favorite thing about the low zone is actually the different types of algae that you can see because there is just such a high diversity of organisms that live in this zone. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to kind of share some photos about like how, just how much algae there simply is. Um, and I wanted to share kind of some of my favorite algae. Um, this one here in this top right corner is, um, I, I want to say it's a five ribbed kelp. I know scientific names and not common names, unfortunately, but the scientific name of this guy is um, Costaria costata. Um, and this one here, its common name is dead man fingers, um, which I think is very interesting. I have no idea why it's called that. Um, but these guys are, are really cool. And algae um, is really important in these type of ecosystems because they are primary producers, much like plants, right? Um, but they're actually not plants, they're protists. And so what you might think of as like um, the roots of a plant um, would be kind of like the holdfast for algae. Um, so the holdfast would be kind of located at the bottom um, and it, it helps the algae attach to the rock or the substrate. Um, but these holdfasts don't actually retain any kind of nutrients. They're simply just to help anchor the, the piece of algae to the rock. Um, Cause you know, when waves are coming in and out of this zone, they're just getting, they're getting smacked around and they need to stay where they are. Um, but these guys are really cool um, and, you know, they don't have leaves, they have blades, uh, but they do photosynthesize like plants. So, um, But also just one other little fun fact, um, whenever you see this kind of grass type thing, if you're in the inner tidal, that is a plant. That's a marine angiosperm. Um, it's a it's a type of surf grass. So that's the, the one main grass that you'll see in the inner tidal. Um, so next we're going to transition to the mid zone. Uh, the mid zone is mostly characterized by vast muscle beds. If you've been on the Oregon coast and been tide pooling, you have certainly seen some muscles and have, have stepped on them, maybe even eaten some. Um, and these guys are really cool because um, there are things that can live underneath the muscle beds and also on top of them. 
Um, and so uh, other things you can find in the mid zone are like barnacles, worms, crabs. Sometimes there's like sea cucumbers, other smaller sea stars that live kind of in between each of the, um, the muscles or underneath them. Uh, but in this photo, kind of on the left of the, the muscle bed photo and to the right, you'll kind of see these like palm tree kind of looking guys. Um, these are sea palms and they're really, really neat. And they um, often live on top of mussels. Um, so if you ever see a living organism and there's another living organism on top of it, um, that's called an epibiont. Uh, epi means on top and biont means um you know, just a living thing. So that's your that's your vocab word of the day, in case you didn't know that one. Um, so there's tons of epibionts that live on top of mussels here in the mid zone. Um, barnacles too. These are these are predatory snails. Uh, they're called nucella, and those guys are really cool. Um, and then you know you'll find some crabs in there here and there. Uh, and then there's the high zone. Um, high zone mostly has barnacles, limpets, rock weeds, um, crustose algae, and a lot of snails. Um, what you would consider more hardy cre sea creatures, like they have kind of shells to them um, because they experience extreme heat fluctuations all the time and are really vulnerable um, to getting dried out and, and vulnerable to desiccation. So um, they have to have structures to help them retain moisture when they can. Um, so I want to cover some intertidal ecology basics because, uh, you know, the basis of the Mangi Lab and, and what I tell people is like we study intertidal ecology. Um, so I want to cover some key concepts that I think are, are really important. Um, I want to talk about keystone species and foundation species. Um, a keystone species uh, is a, a, an organism that keeps the ecosystem together. If you were to remove this species from that ecosystem, the stability and the biodiversity and, and lots of things about the ecosystem will kind of fall apart because it's like you know, the thing that keeps the whole thing flowing, the whole thing together. Um, and a foundation species is normally um, a type of organism that's super abundant um, and plays a strong role in community structures. So I'm going to tell you guys about um, what, what organism is a keystone species in the inner title and what organism is a, is a foundation species. Um, so if you're trying to pulling on the Oregon coast, the most abundant sea star you're going to see is Pisaster acratius. Um, also, its common name is the ochre sea star. Um, it is the keystone species of the rocky inner tidal. They are voracious predators. Um, they mostly eat mussels and barnacles, but sometimes it seems like they'll eat anything. Um, they're also a really important health indicator for this ecosystem. Um, as some of you may have heard, there was a marine disease that broke out in 2014 called sea star wasting disease. That's what SSWD stands for here. Um, that impacted most of the sea star species on the Oregon coast where um, they would be like losing arms or they would have lesions on them, their bodies would deflate. Um, in short, it was pretty gnarly. Um, and there were a lot of sea stars that were dying off and some sea stars were impacted more heavily than others. Um, Pies Aster was impacted pretty heavily, um, but luckily their populations have pounced back and they are doing great. Um, and you'll see them in these three colors will be purple, orange, and brown. And you might be like brown, a brown sea star. That sounds kind of weird. Um, and the best way I know how to describe a brown sea star is it kind of just looks like a cross between an orange sea star and a purple sea star. Um, so let's see, this guy right here is kind of a good, a, a okay example of like a brown one, but this is also kind of an example of a brown one. I think that they're kind of more maroon, but the technical term. Um, and here's another reason why Pisaster are so cool um, is you'll see like a bunch of them kind of hanging out on the rocks here, right? Um, but there's not really too terribly much living at the same, you know, elevation as these guys when you're going up this rock. But then you see like these muscles that start. Um, the really cool thing about Pisaster acratius is that they are able to define the lower limit of the muscle bed. So basically the lowest down that the muscle bed can go is the highest in which um, this sea star can survive because they're just going to eat everything that lives within their range. Like you see these guys kind of up there, they're probably trying to get to some of those muscles and start having lunch. Um, so these guys are really, really cool. Uh, and then middle California anus, which is the California blue mussel, um, is the foundational species in this ecosystem. They are incredibly abundant. Again, if you've been tide pulling on the Oregon coast, like there are thousands of them. Um, and these guys are cool because they're filter feeders. So they're um, 
kind of like mouth is right here and it'll just like open up and water can enter and they can filter um, things out of the water and eat plankton and such. Um, but again, they provide habitat for so many things in the inner tidal. Um, and it's even hard to, to show and explain because they live just so deep um, underneath these mussels and kind of just like right on the rock. But um, things that you can find in there are like crabs, barnacles, worms, some sea cucumbers. Um, it's really neat. Uh, and they're the main food source for Pisaster acracias. Um, this is a fun photo. I was out at a site one day and I saw this like half of a mussel shell and found three juvenile Pisaster hanging out in this shell, um, which I thought was really cute. They just like look like they're snuggling. So I wanted to include that. Um, so next I'm gonna talk about the Mangy Lab and, and what we're all about. Um, to put it in just one sentence, uh, we study rocky shore ecosystem structure and dynamics. Um, and so today I kind of want to talk about some of the projects that we do during our peak field season. Um, these ones are some of my favorites. Uh, they're community surveys, belts, and marsh plots, which I'll cover each of those here shortly. Um, but we do most of our field work in the spring and summer, which is usually um, April to September. Um, and we do most of it in the spring and summer because the weather is much better. Um, and also we have more light. So right now um, we've passed the fall transition and the fall transition is when the tides that are super low and we're able to work switch from really early in the morning to kind of late at night. So we have one coming up soon. We're like, the, I think the low is at like 7 p.m. and then it just kind of like gets later. Um, but it's hard to work at that time of day because it like, you know, it gets really dark. It's hard to see. Um, and if you've been on the Oregon coast in the winter, the waves are kind of gnarly. Um, so we don't end up going out much just for safety reasons. So most of this is done in the spring and summer, really early in the morning. Um, there have been times where I've woken up at 1.30 in the morning and got ready to leave for field work. Um, but we do most of our work in Oregon, but we also have some sites in Central California and Northern California. Uh, first, I want to talk about some essential tide pool tools that we use. Um, so on the left here, we have this is called a transect tape. Um, it's kind of just like a giant a giant measuring tape uh, and you can kind of hold it by that handle up there and normally someone else will take the the end of it and just pull out the tape um, as long as you need it to go and we'll you know set that up somewhere in the inner title and that'll be like our transect line so we'll take a measurement and be like oh we're at zero meters here or one meters here and so it, it gives us an idea of like where we are um, and then this photo on the right this is called a quadrat this guy is about half a meter by a half a meter um, and we use quadrats typically to, to determine percent cover, um, which I will expand on shortly. Um, but when you think about a percentage, a percentage is, is you know, um, you could go from zero to 100. Um, and so typically what we'll do with these quadrats is, um, like in this instance, this quadrat is over some kelp, right? And so we can see that the kelp is taking up 100% of the space in this quadrat. But say, say it wasn't. Say it was only taking up this this bottom corner here, we would say that that's sixteen percent because each of these little squares here equates to four percent. So that makes our lives a little easier when we're assessing percent cover. Um, so first, and my favorite project that I want to talk about are community surveys. Um, I love doing community surveys because it kind of just allows me to to take a step back and really enjoy the ecosystem and the environment that I'm so privileged to like work in and be a part of. Um, and the intertidal zone is just so fun and diverse that I love being able to just sit there and, you know, move algae and identify algae and see what kind of critters are living around the area. Um, so I enjoy this one quite a lot. Um, but we will take quadrats, which we saw on the last slide, uh, and we'll do 10 in the high zone, 10 in the mid zone, and 30 in the low zone, right? And so what we'll do with these quadrats is we'll, we'll set them up in these zones and then we'll estimate the percent cover, which is basically how much space is something taking up in this quadrat. Um, so we'll look at, you know, algae, invertebrates, even bare rock too, where we want to know like how much bare rock is in this area. Um, but one thing we don't estimate percent cover for are mobile invertebrates because they don't live directly on that portion of rock. Um, they're mobile, they can move wherever they want to. Um, so we just count those guys. So sea stars like Pisaster crabs, urchins, etc. 
Uh, we also have belt transects, which we also, we oftenly call um, BTs. And so I have this fun little diagram that I made at the bottom here. Um, so we'll take our transect tape, right? And we'll roll it out. It's about five meters long. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll collect every um, ochre sea star that's within a meter of each side of this transect tape. So it's a, it's a five by two survey. Um, and we'll collect all of them that we can find and we will measure and weigh these guys. Uh, and we do this twice a year, uh, once in the spring and then um, later on in the summer, typically like around August, um, which is really fun when we do it in the summer because um, it's after their spawning season. And sometimes you can find um, little baby sea stars in, in some of the, in the belt transects, which is, they're really cute because sometimes they're only like the size of your, of your pinky. Uh, here's some fun photos of us doing belt transects. Um, so this photo on the left here is um, some of our technicians from last year putting some of the stars back. Um, this top photo right here is actually a seven armed sea star, um, which I had never seen before. Um, the other research assistant, Sailor, and I were out at a site and she found this sea star and she was like, I almost thought that it wasn't a pisaster at first because it was so crazy looking. Um, I can't tell you why it has more than seven arms, but it sure is cool. Um, and then this kind of bottom photo here is us in the dark doing one of those belt surveys. So you can see our transect line here. And then this is this is me right here. Um, and we're just pulling off all the sea stars that we can from the rock gently. We don't want to hurt them and they're, they're okay. Um, and we'll put them in buckets and then we'll take them to whoever's measuring and weighing um, and let them do their, their thing. But um, coming back to tube feet, like we saw with those purple urchins, here's some on uh, on this sea star. It's like, where am I? Why can't I hold on to anything? So those are its um its tube feet, just kind of going crazy. Uh, next, I want to talk about March plots. Um, so we use quadrats for those as well, like we do in community surveys. Um, but a March plot is just like a giant quadrat, basically. Um, so we'll take we'll go um, like four by four, like in a square. So it would be 16 quadrats total. Um, so we'll be out in the field and we're looking for four bolts for a March plot. And once we find all four bolts, um, we've got this bungee cord and PVC pipe and we'll just you know, attach them onto the, on each of the bolts. And that's kind of our, our March plot area. And then we'll take a quadrat and start um, in the like upper left corner. We'll have our backs to the ocean and kind of like orient ourselves uh, and we'll take pictures with each quadrat and we'll go like one, two, three, four, and we'll snake down. Um, and these, this project is really interesting because this March plot doesn't move. It hasn't moved in like, I wanna say 13 years. So what's really interesting is that um, we can take pictures at each of these points, right? And we can compare say, you know, one of our sites four years ago at this exact, point say quadrat one and see how it that exact area was different four years ago versus now. Um, so in short, it's tracking changes in percent cover of organisms over time in these specific areas. Um, so here we talk a lot about sites, um, but I just kind of want to give you guys an idea of what, what and where our, our core sites are at. Um, so our northernmost sites are Fogarty Creek and Boiler Bay. They are, you know, just outside of Depot Bay, if you're familiar with that area, and they're a part of um, Cape Foulweather. We have two sites in Cape Perpetua um, that are Yahats Beach and Strawberry Hill. Um, Yahats Beach is, is really just in, like, the heart of Yahats. And then um, Strawberry Hill, if you've ever been to, like, the Strawberry Hill Wayside, it's just kind of south of, um, of Yahats. That's where that site is as well. And then our southernmost Oregon sites are in Port Orford, Oregon. Um, it's about like three and a half, four hours from Corvallis. Um, and these ones will go and stay in Port Orford overnight because it's such a long drive and we'll work those sites. Um, and most of the cool critter photos that I have in this presentation are from Rocky Point because that one's the coolest in my opinion. Um, so next I kind of want to talk about our lab Instagram. Um, this is something that we've kind of, I feel like talked about doing for a little while now. Um, but we hadn't really quite done it yet. And, um, we're just out in the field so frequently and see so many cool things and are taking pictures of like 
you know, the ocean or our sites or each other, and we just share them with each other, but why not share them with the rest of the world, really? Um, it's not uncommon for research labs to have social media accounts. Um, in fact, many at Oregon State do, and there's, a, you know, a bunch of other institutions that do as well. Um, so I uh, spearheaded actually making this lab Instagram, and I'm the one who primarily runs it right now. Um, so if you have an Instagram account and you feel so inclined, please go follow the Menke Lab underscore OSU on Instagram. Um, and we post things like field photos. Um, I also do uh, lab member spotlights where I, I send out a Google form and members of the lab will, um, you know, fill about fill out information about themselves. And if um, they have a research project going on, they'll kind of write about that and I'll have them send me photos and um, talk about like how they got involved with the lab. Um, I think it's really important to to get an idea of of who's a part of the lab and kind of what the lab vibe is about, especially for like prospective undergraduate and graduate students too. Um, I also post upcoming events to the the story, so I actually shared the the Cape Perpetual Collaborative's uh, Instagram post about tonight about this webinar on uh, on our Instagram page. Um, and right now we're kind of in the off season and we're not doing too much field work right now. So there's a lot of conferences going on and presentations. Um, so we'll post about student and faculty presenting um, their research. Um, and this I just want to share is the coolest video on my camera roll to date um, that I put on the Instagram. This is a giant Pacific octopus. Again, I stuck my phone upside down in the water. But this was this was the greatest thing I'd ever done in terms of putting my phone upside down in the water. Um, and you can just see like the color is so vibrant and this thing is just so huge. It's like just such an awesome experience. Um, you will see it is it is grabbing a student's hand there, but he has all of his fingers and he had the time of his life. So no harm, no foul. Um, so this is kind of like a screen shot of, of what the Instagram kind of looks like right now. These are our uh, most recent nine posts and you'll see this row here. Um, has the lab member spotlights, um, but I post, you know, pictures of us going out to collect water samples. Um, it was our primary investigator, Bruce Mangi. It was his birthday recently, so I did um, a special post for him. Um, if you attended a Young Wavemaker webinar last year, you might have seen uh, Zach Mounier, who um, actually just finished his PhD recently. So it's actually Dr. Zach Mounier. So cool. We're all so proud of him. Um, and some other people um, had made him a cool sea star pinata. So I wanted to like shout out Zach because we're all so proud of him and, and this wonderful accomplishment. Um, and, you know, just cool, cool views in the field. Um, we all just like love taking pictures and sharing what we've seen. Um, and I also try and make reels of um, each Tide series that went well for a little bit, but I just am so busy that sometimes I can't just be taking videos all the time, but I'll try and highlight like, what we did during the week, um, which is really fun. And I'll typically pick the song in the back as like a song that we've all been listening to throughout the week. Um, so this is just kind of another example of what part of our page would look like if you're on it. Um, and then this reel on the left here is actually when four of us went to Northern California to work some of our sites there. Um, I just compiled a lot of the videos that we had all taken throughout the week, um, just camping together for a week straight. Um, so people could see what we do in Northern California as well. Um, these are, I think, some of the funniest components of the lab Instagram. I'll say the funniest um, photo, which is on the left for last. Um, but this little video here is one of our grad students, Megan, just getting like pelted by a wave, which we all kind of thought was funny because it happens every time. Um, this top photo here is of John, uh, our faculty research assistant. Um, you'll see he's holding something and you're like, what is that? Um, it's a type of invertebrate. It's a it's a gumboot chitin, um, and they kind of just look like intertidal meatloaf, uh, to put it plainly. Um, but they kind of curl up if you take them off the rock. So he's he's holding it like it's a baby, and he's tickling it. Um, this is like top three funniest photos of John ever, I think. Um, this bottom photo is of me when I when we found all of the marked plots, but we couldn't access them because the tide was too high. So I was very tired and I was kind of over it. So someone captured um, my emotions in that moment very well. Um, and then here on the left, um, this is this is Bruce Mangi. This is the man, the myth, the legend. 
the guy who runs our lab, the one who started it all, um, the the intertidal ecology guru. Um, he just recently turned 80 earlier this month, and I knew he was going to be out of town for Halloween. So um, I had a bald cap, and I decided I was going to dress up as Bruce on his 80th birthday. Um, though he was a little offended at first because he's like, I have hair. Why did your bald cap not have hair? It did. I used a silver Sharpie, and my coworker helped me helped me draw um, in Sharpie on the bald cap. So it did kind of look like he had hair. Um, but I think I got the Bruce outfit down really well. Uh, and he's notorious for wearing that red jacket. So a friend of mine let me borrow his red jacket. And um, I think I look great, in in my opinion. Um, it's top 10, one of the funniest things I've ever done. Um, and here's some more just fun field photos. Um, this was the, the core four going to Northern California this year. We actually had the opportunity to um, work a site at Bodega Marine Laboratory, which is um, the marine laboratory that UC Davis owns, which is really sweet. Um, this photo here um, is us going through a grotto in Port Orford. Um, so you'll see this like channel is filled with water and we can't walk through it. Um, so we have to like scale over the rocks through this, this grotto to get to our site. Um, and there's actually, I think this might be me right here. I can't quite tell, but there's actually like a tree wedged in there too that we have to kind of like crawl over and then we can get to our site. So we, um, We'll, we'll set up people along the rocks and just kind of pass all of our gear through. Um, this was one of my first um, experiences doing field work in California. This was actually on a Space Force base, which I did not know was a thing until I got there, um, which was, was really neat. This is in Vandenberg, California. Um, and then this photo here uh, is us surveying a transect. It's a vertical transect, so it's not like flat and horizontal. Um, on a rock, it's, it's vertical. Um, and the high point of this transect was too high for any of us to reach. So this is John on top of um, one of our uh, undergraduate interns, Eli. Um, he's just sitting on Eli's shoulders trying to like survey at this one transect. Um, so that was a really, really funny moment. Um, and then, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. I feel like John and I are always trying to reach stuff in weird ways. Um, we're trying to take a picture of um, what's living on this side of this transect. Um, and this is kind of like our, our camera contraption that we have, um, but we can't quite reach it. So um, I had to hold this contraption while John is, is taking a photo. Um, and this photo on the right here is me and a couple of my very best friends. Um, some of my friends have come out and helped do field work with us over the years. Um, this is my friend Madeline and Kelly, um, and they helped us do belt surveys this, this day. Um, and I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off because I was the only tech, um, but they were great. They held down the fort. They were helping brewers collect sea stars. And, you know, we listened to Taylor Swift the whole way to the site and back, um, and it's, you know, easily one of my favorite moments in the field. And I love being able to share um, what I do uh, with my friends and them being able to see it firsthand. And um, I appreciate them getting up so early to do it with me. Um, so I want to pivot a little bit, um, maybe pivot a lot. Um, but I want to talk about student research at OSU. Um, so there are three ways that undergraduate students can get involved um, with research in our lab and be paid for it. Um, first is URSA Engage. This is mostly for first and second year students. Um, it's 15 weeks long, typically from like February to June, I want to say, where students are working five hours a week on their own independent research project in the lab. Um, there's also the Summer Undergraduate Research Experience, which is SURE, which is 11 weeks, um, 40 hours a week, so you're like, you know, full-time doing research, um, and you can be any year in school as long as you um, are a current OSU student and hadn't already graduated. Uh, and then new this year is launching undergraduate research experiences Lure. Um, this is for the entire academic year, um, about 10 hours a week and also a paid position. Um, but this, this um, experience has a preference for juniors and seniors. Um, so I think paying undergraduates is really, really important. And you might be wondering, like, why should undergraduates be paid? Um, at least in in my scenario, which I'll talk about shortly, um, I, you know, when I was sorting through biomass in the lab, I didn't feel very connected to that project. I wasn't like super engaged. I didn't feel very engaged in, in research until I went out in the field. 
Um, but paying undergraduates to do their own independent research um, better connects them with their project. Um, they get a, a vast um, array of skills afterwards, like they're able to, um, you know, really see our project from start to finish. Um, and also financial stability is really important for, for students. Um, I am very privileged in that I was able to make time in my schedule to be able to volunteer um, and, and work in the lab, but other people don't didn't have that experience. Um, and I think that you really limit the amount of people that can partake and, and conduct undergraduate research if you're not able to pay very many of them. Um, and I think in in the long term, this can create a more diverse scientific community if you are enabling, you know, everyone to to be able to participate in, in these kind of experiences um, by paying as many as you possibly can. Um, so I want to talk about how the SURE program changed my life. Um, I would not be giving this webinar today if it was not for SURE. Um, and I, I almost know that for a fact um, because I learned so much during those 10 weeks, it's kind of absurd. Um, I had my own independent research project working on um, sunflower sea stars, which are critically endangered because they were greatly impacted by um, sea star wasting disease. Uh, like over 95% of these sea stars were lost to that disease. Um, I also had faculty mentorship. Um, Dr. Sarah Graham has been my, my research mentor for a couple of years now. And we joke that she's my academic mom. I, I just love her. I have learned so much by being one of her students and I, I can't wait to take those experiences and everything that I've learned from, from Graham to um, you know wherever I go next. Um, I also got experience collecting data and analyzing that data. Uh, Sarah helped me put all of my data into, into software and we made great graphs, um, which I was able to later pr present at different conferences. Um, but I also got a ton of field experience. I was basically just like a, like a secondary technician, really, because I got to go out and work every single tide with the field team all of last summer, um, which made me a great candidate for the position that I have now. And I, I, I don't know if I would have this position if I hadn't um, had this experience and was paid for it. I, you know, I couldn't afford to just do 40 hours a week of, of research for an entire summer. That's just was not possible for me. Um, so I just want to share some photos uh, of my first couple of weeks doing the SURE program. Uh, most of these photos were taken in Central California along the Big Sur coastline. Um, and this trip was really wonderful for me. Um, I am a military child and so we we moved around a good bit and we used to live in Central California. Um, and some of my favorite memories with my parents are um, the few times we went to the beach. Um, and so we were kind of in the Pismo area on this trip, right? And we're driving in that area and I see this park. And I'm like, I have a weird feeling about this park. And then I put it together that um, I had been to this park when I was like, probably six, seven years old. My mom is here, so she can correct me on that soon. Um, but, you know, I just remember it because there are these like cool dinosaur bones like, sticking out of the sand. And I was like, oh my gosh, this just like unlocked a core memory. Like I was here when I was itty bitty. This is crazy. Um, and then, you know, as we were kind of working our way back up the California coast, we, we spent a day at um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which my dad took me to when I was younger. I, you know, want to won a free ticket and a raffle. And then he, he took me and I, I still think about that day as like one of my favorite days with him ever. Um, and so, you know, in short to kind of wrap up this like anecdotal portion is that, you know, after I started this internship, it made me really feel like I, I belonged here and that I was like meant to be here. And this is what I was meant to do after like these whole, you know, 360 moments from, from my childhood, um, you know, wrapped up till last summer was a really cool experience for me. Um, I also got to present my research at a couple of really cool um, conferences. I got to present at the Western Society of Naturalists in Oxnard, California. I gave a speed talk uh, about the reproductive timing of sunflower sea stars um, to help inform species recovery. Um, and this really got me out of my comfort zone and I'm very thankful that I had this experience. Um, there was also a panel later on about sunflower sea stars that I wasn't on, but somebody asked a question that was relevant to my project. And my research advisor, advisor Sarah Graham, is just sitting right here. And someone asked a question like, oh, well, like, when are they spawning? And she just points at me. And I'm like, oh. And then, you know, I start answering the question. 
And then, the, but there were more questions that came up that were like relevant to the project that I had done. So um, the other sure student that came to that conference with me, it was like, Brenna, go sit up there, like go grab a chair. Like you're answering questions. You're basically a part of the panel. I was like, ah, oh, okay. Um, so I grabbed this chair that was literally right here and sat down. Um, so this is me kind of on the on the edge here. But a, a funny thing is that um, the person next to me, his name is Augie. Um, he used to be a research assistant um, at the University of Washington, and he was like rearing these sunflower sea stars and had a um, a really cool experience with with them. Um, he is now a graduate student in our lab. So it's kind of funny. He was like at a different institution then, and I didn't really know him. And now I just go bother him in his desk randomly. Um, so that was a I just found that photo again today. And I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot about this. And Augie's sitting right next to me, so cool. Um, and then this photo on the right is me presenting at State of the Coast, which some of you might've been to. Um, it's Oregon's Coastal Conference and they um, invite students to come present their research, um, which was a really neat opportunity for me. I got to chat with like OSU faculty, fellow students, um, citizens that you know live on the Oregon coast about um, the reproductive timing of sunflower sea stars and why they are so important and why they are critically endangered and you know what steps are we taking to help them. Um, so that was actually all that I had um, for you guys today. Uh, I didn't want to talk everybody's ear off too much, but I do want to say thank you all for, for being here. This has been a really cool opportunity for me. Um, I appreciate you all sitting through um, me babbling for an extended period of time. Um, but I wanted to share some cool links. Um, so I know since this is like screen share, you can't necessarily click on the link. So I kind of figured out ways to like prompt you how to Google things. Um, so if you're interested in just reading more about the lab overall, our lab website, if you just Google like the Lepchenko Mangi Lab, it should be the first thing that pops up. Um, our lab Instagram is uh, Mangi Lab underscore OSU. Um, shameless plug, you should so go follow that. We have over 200 followers. I feel like an intertidal influencer. <laughs> um, and also, if you are interested and have the means to um, donate to URSA or Shore and more, um, I also have links for you to do that if you are interested. Um, I know when I was a Shore student, they had mentioned that they were kind of having a hard time getting donors um, to donate to this fund. And um, like, the you know, the more money they have, the more students that they can fund. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'll i say it again, like, I really don't think I would be giving this talk if it wasn't for these programs. And I, I just think that they are really important programs and they're just very near and dear to my heart. So this is kind of like a shameless plug, um, if you have the means to. Um, that would be lovely, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but if you want to donate to URSA, that's through the Office of Academic Affairs. Uh, if you Google OSU Academic Affairs, hit donate and then donate online today. You can donate to the URSA Engage program. Uh, if you're interested in donating to Shure and Lure, which are specifically for College of Science students, um, normally like biology majors, physics, biochemistry, chemistry, et cetera. Um, there's a link below to do that, um, but also you can just Google Oregon State University Foundation, hit giving, and then choose um, the Science Scholars Fund. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about is if you have any burning questions afterwards, please feel free to email me. Um, I would be happy to answer any of your questions. I am really honored and really excited that I've gotten this opportunity to share my love and passion for the inner title. And I would just simply be honored if you had, you know, questions for me afterwards. Um, but that's, yeah, all that I have for you guys today. But um, thank you so much for coming and I'm happy to answer any immediate questions. Oh my gosh, thank you, Brenna. That was so great. I am so happy to have you. Thank you so much for being able to come and do this for us. Um, for everyone who's in the chat, we are very much willing to answer any questions that you have. Um, and then for the future, you guys will be getting sent out an email when I post this on YouTube, and I will be happy to post all the links and stuff in the description of that as well. So Thank you. we'll be covered on that boat. But um, for now, we'd love to just spend a few minutes for anyone who has burning questions. And then otherwise, we will see you at our next event. Do you have a question? Oh, nice. Okay, I think it's letting Perfect. me. <laughs> um, great presentation. That was wonderful. Um, I was wondering, like, what kind of your future plans were, which I know may be kind of a rough question to ask. But if you wanted to tell anyone about kind of 
what you're thinking for the next steps, if you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So for the next year ish, um, I'm like 98% sure uh, I'm being promoted to a faculty research assistant position, which is really cool. Um, so I'll be continuing to work with the Mengi Lab for the next um, year, at least until next fall. Um, hopefully next fall I get into a PhD bro- program. Um, fingers crossed someone wants to let me in. Um, and, you know, I want to continue to study intertidal ecology. Um, I kind of feel like I would be cheating myself if I decided to study something else. Um, and there aren't a lot of researchers that stay in the same field for a long time, um, which I think can be a good and a bad thing, but I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty set. And also I get really sick on boats. So I think that's not for me. (laughs) Thank you. The question. Yeah. And then someone else asked, um, what is your favorite tide pool location? Oh, I have like a secret spot, but there's, there's not that many people here. So I will, I will spill the tea. Um, (laughs) if you are just North of Depot Bay, um, and there's a kind of like the Boiler Bay Wayside, if you're familiar with that area, it's kind of just off of 101. Uh, you can park there, or you can just put it in your Google Maps, like Boiler Bay, and you park there and you kind of follow this trail north. And um, it's like really short. You kind of follow it north and then go down this trail and then you reach Manipulation Bay. Um, sorry, that was like a long winded way to, to talk about that, but it's kind of like a secret location. Um, because not a lot of people know about it and it's a little harder to find but if you can find it I think it's worth it it's like nice and flat too so you can kind of go pretty far um also just like an easy place to tide pool is um seal rock I love tide pooling with seal rock nice seal rock is a great option and then for broiler bay too there are also a crazy amount of huckleberry bushes if anyone likes berry pucking so highly recommend um I saw someone else with their hand up with a question I'm happy to get that for you if you'd like to ask the question again i think this one's my mother we saw you put a sea star on your face what did it smell like (laughs) when is this i i love you this does not surprise me at all mom um (laughs) i don't know i don't think that they have like a distinct smell they kind of just smell i mean you know the like stereotypical like low tide not fun smell um kind of like that but more like water um there are some sea stars that do have a distinct smell, though. Um, leather stars, which I didn't include a picture of, those ones apparently smell kind of garlicky. Interesting. Yeah. So if you're out and you see a leather star, go sniff it. I'll be, I'll be happy to sniff any sea stars that I come across at this point to update that. Yeah, maybe you should. We should report back. We'll make like a spreadsheet. That should like, be what the next you- Instagram post. Is just what do sea stars smell like? Actually, that's a good one. Wait, <laughs> that's a good one. You're so smart. We've got a few other questions too. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, it, okay. So Zek asked this question. If you um, could establish any conservation measures for rocky intertidal habitats, what would you enact? Oh, this is a good and difficult question. <laughs> any conservation measures for rocky intertidal habitats? Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. I think um there's there's tide pool ambassadors i know here in oregon and there are also some in washington but i think uh, maybe having more of them and and some that are like paid in full time I, I know some of the ones that are up in washington where i grew up uh, are just volunteers um but i feel like in a lot of places where tide pools are public access there's not really someone down there a lot of the time to like kind of help make sure people aren't like messing with the organisms too much um, so that's kind of like the first thing that I would think of um, is kind of more like environmental stewardship and that way, like having more people like out in the field and making sure people are learning things, but also interacting with the ecosystem safely. That was a good question. You stumped me on that one. Um, okay. Elena asked, other than Sunflower Star, what is your favorite sea star? Uh, this has changed as of this year. And this is a, it's a bat star. Um, they kind of are just like webby. I love them so much that I was like mid fall one time, but I saw like a bat star underneath a rock and I was like, worth it. I love these things. Um, so yeah, I, I just love sea stars. Thank you. Um, what would happen if the sea stars went extinct? You said they were integral to the environment. Um, it is hard to say. I think that, um, a lot of like the community would shift in general, like, um, 
the C stars, you know, they mark that that lower boundary for the muscles, they would definitely be able to recruit further and further down. But I also think that that kind of lessens low zone diversity because um, the sea stars can like clear off that space for other things to live to. Um, so I think it would have a profound impact on um, just the local biodiversity of that area. Um, Kira asked, what piqued your initial interest in sea stars? I don't know. I. I just think they're cool. I'm sorry, that's like a, a bad way to answer that. But um, I don't know, they're, they're, they're cute and they're tiny and I can pick them up and they're easy to find. I don't always pick them up um, just occasionally when I get really excited about them. Um, yeah, I just think they're neat little guys. I can't I can't quite explain it. Um, and then Sarah asked, how is climate change affecting the West Coast intertidal? Uh, in so many ways, I feel like. Um, so let's see, I, I think about sometimes not necessarily the inner title in this case, but near shore ecosystems. Um, as some of you may have heard, um, there's a bunch of purple urchins off of um, off of our, our coastlines and they're eating up all the kelp, which is really bad because kelp forests are, are great ecosystems for a variety of different organisms. Their primary producers, kelp forests are just like the bomb. Um, but there are too many sea urchins because um, we've lost mostly those those sunflower sea stars that are now critically endangered. Um, and we don't think that climate change has has you know directly caused sea star waste and disease, but it is likely that it did it did play a role. And also um, the presence of um, just like sorry, I have to figure out how I'm gonna my brain's like buffering right now. Um, you know we're experiencing warmer than average air temperatures every year. Like the climate is just getting hotter and hotter. And um, these organisms I fear are not necessarily going to know how to adapt to their environment. You know, we also have marine heat waves, like just heat waves in general, like atmospheric and marine heat waves. Um, I fear that uh, maybe like a tipping point is coming where a certain amount of organisms can't necessarily withstand those kind of um, temperature changes. Um, but intertidal ecosystems are really important to study in that aspect, though, is because like they experience such extreme heat fluctuations that they they can handle it. But I think after a certain point, there's only going to be so much they can handle. That was so long winded. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that was a great answer, though. It's such a broad question that you always yeah. have to be pretty long winded for that kind of thing. So that was a great. Oh, my God. Thank you so much for coming. This was really wonderful. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions, but again, um, everybody will get an email like tomorrow or something after this with all of the information. So if you guys have any burning questions tonight when you can't sleep and you're thinking about this presentation, please feel free to use that info. Um, but other than that, thank you guys all so much. And I hope to see you at the next Young Waymaker seminar. Thank you again, Brenna. This was great. Thank you. Cat meowing in the background. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>